and we must begin with, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are in the book of Acts, and uh, we were mentioning that Acts, Acts's historical reliability is, uh, is really good. And um, we gave you uh, some uh, opinions ap about that, but I want to give you just a little more um, evidence for the historical reliability of Acts. Number one, Christians are devoted to the truth. It would be out of character for a Christian historian to embellish the truth, okay? Ancient historians had a concern for accuracy in their recording of history. Luke would also have that same concern. There are those who say that Luke, uh, that Paul was Luke's hero and that he distorts the truth to make Paul look good. But I would counter that, uh, that Luke's portrayal uh, does that, uh, but rather his portrayal of Paul shows a commitment to the truth. Paul works manually to support himself. Manual labor was despised by Greco-Roman society. If Luke wanted to portray Paul in a better light, he would not have included that information. Uh, another fact, in Damascus, Paul is sought by the Jews who probably instigated Eretus, the king of the Nabataeans, to attempt to capture Paul. But instead of facing the Jews, he was let down in a basket over the wall and escaped some hero. In fact, fleeing is a way of life for Paul, whether it's in Damascus or Jerusalem or Ephesus or Thessalonica or Berea, Paul flees for his life. Even though we can trust the reliability of Acts, we should also realize that it's not a complete church, uh, complete history of the early church. In fact, even though we have a history of the early church in Acts, much more happened than we know about. Acts deals primarily with Peter and Paul. But what about the other apostles? What about Barnabas after he and Paul separated? We know how the gospel went to Rome, or how Paul's taking of the gospel went to Rome. Actually, we don't know how the gospel originally got to Rome, because there was a church there before Paul went. But what about how the gospel went east? You know, we don't know that. Uh, tradition says that Thomas took the gospel to India, and others took the gospel eastward but we have no record in the Bible. When Paul gives the record of the appearances of the risen Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he gives appearances there that are not recorded in any of the Gospels. That tells us what a small bit of the history of the church that we really know. All right, uh, so we can be confident of Acts uh, historical reliability. The date, this is how the book of Acts ends. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So what happened after the two years? We're left dangling. Why does the book of Acts end so abruptly? The best answer is that when Luke finished the book of Acts, Paul was still in prison in Rome awaiting trial before Nero. That would put the date of the book at around 62 to 63. Um, you know, Acts leaves us dangling. We, we want some resolution. What happened to Paul? We don't know. 
Why didn't Luke include it? Well, you know, I think that probably at this point in the story, he doesn't know what's going to happen to Paul. He's just about come to the end of his scroll, and he wants to go ahead and finish the book, and so he does. That's just where he was at that time. That, that is my theory. Um, and that would put it around 62 or 63 AD. Any questions here, comments? All right. <clears throat> the purpose. Acts is a historical book, um, but like the Gospels, Acts is not just a historical book. It gives history, but it is sacred history. It is for the purpose of establishing the faith of Theophilus. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Carson and Moo state Luke's purpose in the broadest terms. To communicate that God's salvation was revealed in and made available through his son, Jesus Christ. The message of that salvation was entrusted by Christ himself to his apostles, and through the empowering and directing of the Holy Spirit, they now have brought that message and the salvation it mediates to the ends of the earth. Uh, but no doubt, some of the same specific intentions that we found in Luke were there as well. To emphasize the religious piety, moral purity, and political innocence of the Christians and to show Christianity is universal in scope. Uh, last time we looked at Paul's founding of the church in Corinth, we saw Paul before Gallio. Gallio uh, would not take the uh, accusations of the Jews against uh, Paul there, against the Christians. And, and so perhaps Luke did that to show the political innocence of the Christians. They were not there to overthrow the government. According to Kumal, it tells of the apostolic time in order to edify the Christians and to convert the pagans. I think that probably Luke wants to assure Theophilus that the church is not a break-off sect of Judaism, but is carrying on the work of God in the world as the continuation of Judaism. Jesus brought to fulfillment the prophecies of the Old Testament, and those who align with him are the spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. So it, it seems like that that is uh, perhaps what uh, Luke wants to accomplish here in the book of Acts. So who speaks for God? Acts tells us that a transition has taken place in which the scribes and Jewish rulers have been superseded by the apostles. Luke also wants to show how Gentiles are included in the people of God because of the work of Christ. Luke wants to establish the legitimacy of Christianity to both Jewish and Gentile worlds. Uh, scholars, of course, have proposed other uh, purposes for Acts, such as uh, F.C. Bauer said that it was a conciliatory document that uh, was written to uh, reconcile the Jewish and Gentile uh, segments of the early church. I think we can for sure lay that hypothesis aside. Just as the Gospels show how Jesus goes to Jerusalem, the capital of Palestine, so Acts shows how Christianity goes to Rome the capital of the world empire. What about an outline 
of Acts. Acts divides into two main sections. The first half, which is chapters 1 to 12, deals with the church in and around Jerusalem. The second half, which is chapters 13 to 28, deals with the spread of the church to Rome. Now, the basic outline of Acts is given in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, here is Da Silva's outline of, of Acts. Uh, first of all, the prologue, commissioning of the apostles, and restoration of the twelve in chapter 1, verses 1 to 26. Then the rebuilding of the house of David, 2.1 to 9.31. The first fruits of the Gentile mission, 9.32 to 12.25. And here we would be uh, talking about Cornelius and the spread of the gospel to Antioch. Paul's missionary journeys, 13.1 to 21.14 and then Paul's journey to Rome, 2115 to 2831. And um, here's Gundry's outline of Acts. Um, and we're gonna see that these various outlines show basically the same kind of thing. Uh, they're rearranged a little differently, but they're going to show the church centered in Jerusalem and then to the rest of the world. The acts of the Spirit of Christ in and out from Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Pentecost, persecution, uh, and growth, and martyrdom of Stephen. Out from Jerusalem, Philip's ministry, Paul's conversion, Cornelius' household, martyrdom of James and Zebedee, and then uh, two, the acts of the Spirit of Christ far and wide through the Apostle Paul. Paul's first missionary journey, the Judaizing controversy. Um, Raymond Brown here about the um, Jerusalem Conference says the Jerusalem Conference may be, uh, may be judged, judged the most important meeting in the history of Christianity. For there implicitly, it was decided that the following of Jesus would soon move beyond Judaism and become a separate religion reaching to the ends of the earth. Um, the importance of the Jerusalem Council there cannot be overestimated. As the gospel spread to Antioch, and then beyond Antioch through Paul's journeys, uh, Gentiles were not made to be circumcised. They didn't have to become Jews in order to be Christians. And the Jewish conservative Christians in Jerusalem did not uh, go along with that. Uh, for them, you need to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. And so the Apostolic Council in Acts 15 was held with all of the leaders of the church, uh, Paul and Barnabas and the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, James, Peter, and the others. And it was decided that you do not have to become a Jew in order to to be a Christian. And uh, that was so important, because if it had gone the other way, uh, I'm afraid that the church would not have grown the way it did. It would have been another sect of Judaism. So this opened up the gospel to people like you and me, who were not born Jews. <coughs> so it was an important uh, landmark decision there in chapter 15. 
We then have Paul's second missionary journey, Paul's third missionary journey, the events in Jerusalem, events in Caesarea, and Paul's voyage to Rome. Okay. Um, we have the preaching of Paul to Jews and Gentiles in his Roman house prison as the last part that we have here. Now, Hayes and Duval show how Peter and Paul have parallel events of their lives in Acts. Uh, so we're looking now at the first part of Acts, Peter, and the second part of Acts, Paul. We have Peter's sermon at Pentecost. And we have Paul's sermon at Pisidian Antioch, the healing of a lame man in chapter 3, healing of a lame man in chapter 14, the shaking of a building by prayer in chapter 4, shaking of a building by praise in chapter 16, where they're in Philippi and they're in, in jail and uh, the whole building shakes, jailhouse rock. Uh, we have the rebuke of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, the rebuke of Elymas in chapter 13, healing by the shadow of Peter and healing by handkerchiefs from Paul, laying on of hands in 8 and 19, rebuke of Simon the sorcerer, rebuke of Jewish sorcerer, resuscitation of Tabitha, resuscitation of Eutychus, removal of chains in prison, and removal of chains in prison. So not only is there, are, are there parallels between Luke and Acts, there are also parallels in the two halves here of Acts. Uh, I want to share just briefly the kerygma, the preaching of the early church. And C.H. Uh, Dodd, an important work from the 1930s, uh, went through the uh, sermons in Acts and also the uh, parts of Paul's letters and pulled out what he believed was the early preaching of the early church. And uh, these are the, the six steps that he comes up with. Number one, in their preaching, now this would be to unbelievers. The age of fulfillment has dawned. Number two, this has taken place through the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Number three, by virtue of the resurrection, Jesus has been exalted at the right hand of God as messianic head of the new Israel. Number four, the Holy Spirit in the church is the sign of Christ's present power and glory. Number five, the messianic age will shortly reach its consumma consummation in the return of Christ. And number six, there is a call to repentance, the offer of forgiveness in the Holy Spirit, and the promise of salvation. So this was um, an outline of the evangelistic preaching that we see in Acts. Now notice that this outline is for um, Jews. It was not the way they preached to Gentiles. If you told a pagan the age of fulfillment has dawned, he would have no idea what you're talking about. It was the fulfillment of the Old Testament uh, scriptures, and pagans would not be familiar with that. So when we see sermons to pagans in the uh, New Testament, it is it begins where they are and then leads them to the cross. So in, um, in Athens, Paul sees the altar to the unknown God, and that is where he starts his sermon. Uh, and he starts where they are, and he leads them to Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Okay, uh, do you have questions or comments here? Just a comment, doctor. Yes, uh, and a question also. 
Because okay. I've uh, I noticed that uh, Paul was uh, saved. I don't. Uh, it's not clear for me if uh, Paul was saved on the way uh, to Damascus or the time that uh, uh, Ananias prayed for him. And uh, I think it's it's it is also a uh, argument. Also, I say debatable part of those who. Uh, are saying that baptism of uh, water is necessary for salvation, as it's mentioned in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Yeah. But uh, I think, uh, I don't know, Doctor, if I am correct to say that uh, Paul was uh, uh, saved on uh, his way to Damascus because that time when uh, Jesus appeared to him, he, commis he commissioned him uh and uh, on his commission i think it would seem unlikely that christ would commission paul if paul uh, had not yet believed in him right i don't know if i'm correct yeah uh, i feel very certain that paul was saved on the road to damascus uh, and, and like you say not only was he saved but he was also uh called he was commissioned to uh, be the apostle to the gentiles and uh, I would find it rather strange that God would commission somebody to be an apostle if they weren't saved. Um, Paul's theology is all rooted in that experience on the road to Damascus. Justification by faith, the whole thing finds its roots right there in that, um, that experience that Paul had on the road to Damascus. Yeah. So it, it's not baptismal regeneration. It's, it is justification by faith. Yeah. Any other questions or comments here? Yes, uh, buy-in. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, buy-in. Bayan, you're muted. I can't hear you. There you oh, go. Your, your input on Paul's possible fourth missionary journey to Iberia, to Spain, and then he apparently some say that he was rearrested and then by uh, Nero's agents and then brought back for his final trial, mm -hmm. his final audience. I, mm -hmm. Have you? I, I I've heard that. Yeah, we're going to deal with that. Okay. Uh, probably a little later today, if not next time. Okay. But to, to answer it now, yes, I believe that there was a fourth missionary journey. Okay. Okay. All right. Dr. Um, Gallon. Yes. It was interesting uh, when uh, Paul just uh, uh, got conver uh, converted to become a follower of Jesus, and he straight away started his journey preaching and teaching. But it's contradicted with what he taught us in uh, Timothy 3, how to choose the uh, leaders. Uh, he said that we, we're not supposed to be just the church leader or just a new convert. Uh -huh. It's a new Christian. But he himself, is that because of the different experience when he become a Christian? Uh I think the situation is a little different there. We are talking about becoming a, a leader in a, an established church. Uh, God commissioned Paul, Christ commissioned Paul, uh, who, was, who was thinking that he was doing God's will, but he was wrong. And he confronts, he is confronted by Christ. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Everything, his whole life, his worldview changes. And he realizes that the Messiah has come. The one that they were looking forward to all along has come. And then what do you do after the Messiah has come? How does that change Judaism? How does that change your life? And um, so when uh, we'll deal with this in a little bit too. 
But after he uh, goes into Damascus blind, and uh, Ananias comes to him and prays for him, and his sight is restored, and he's baptized, um, he then said he, uh, he said in Galatians that he didn't consult with other people, that rather he went to Arabia, and we'll deal with what he means by that as well. Um, so he went away. He did not go into the church and say, okay, now I'm your leader. He went into Arabia, and uh, I think he probably engaged in evangelism there, and I'll tell you why later. But um, he then uh, came back to Damascus, and he preached that Jesus was the Christ, or that the Christ was Jesus. And um, so I, I just seems that the situation is different from Timothy's situation. There we are dealing with an established church there in Ephesus. And um, who is going to be the proper leader of this church? Or who are the leaders? It's a, it's a plural uh, uh, kind of leadership. And uh, then Paul gives the qualifications. And like you say, one of them is not a new believer, not a novice, as King James calls it. Um, but, um, you know, we need to realize that before Paul went on his first missionary journey, it was 10 years, probably more than 10 years, after his conversion. Three years before he went to Rome, is that right? Before he went to Rome? Uh, before he went to Rome or Jerusalem? Is that Rome? I hope I didn't make a mistake in my, in my assignment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it, was, it was 10 years before, after his conversion, before he went on his first missionary journey. Uh, okay. You know, that was, that would be with Barnabas and John Mark. Um, so, so he didn't just uh, go into his missionary journeys immediately. Now, he did evangelize, and he worked in the area of Tarsus, Cilicia, before Barnabas went and got him uh, to work with him in Antioch. Okay. Uh, other questions, comments? Thanks. Yes, Dr. Kalen. Yes, Gustavo. Um, I have a question regarding this kerygma. Um, All right. Outline that you shared. Yes. Uh, and that it was different from Jews, that from Gentiles. Um, do we have a, a, an outline, per se, that how that kerygma would be for the Gentiles? Wow. Hey, Gustavo, that is a great subject for a research paper. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because uh, the reason I ask him is uh, in current, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he shared what the gospel is, mm -hmm. I found a really similar outline to the one I've seen in this in the screen yes and that was part right of, that was part of the research that went into this that you see on the the powerpoint okay but but current was not a jewish church mostly or or it was not mostly but it did begin in the synagogue you remember paul went okay. to the synagogue preached there uh even the ruler of the synagogue the leader of the synagogue was converted, so it did begin in the synagogue. Okay. Um, what you have in 1 Corinthians 15 is going to apply to probably any situation. Yeah, Christ, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, Christ <clears throat> died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, if it's a, a total pagan, he wouldn't know about the scriptures but that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he was uh, seen 
that is all part of the gospel, no matter who it goes to. Okay. 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 But, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that is an intriguing question. Um, the kerygma to pagans. What was the kerygma to pagans? How did it work? And so it is, uh, is yeah. some similar that we call today in missions context contextualization. Will that be? Yes, it would be. It would be contextualized. Okay. And Thank you, sir. Um, how you in your various countries, all of you, present the gospel is probably going to be different, somewhat, from um, from other countries because it needs to be contextualized. So begin where people are and um, take them to the cross. And I remember I was teaching 1 Corinthians once, and we were in chapter 1, where he talks about the, the uh, message of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks. It's a stumbling block to Jews, but to us who believe it is the power and wisdom of God. Uh, I had a student from China, and she asked, or she said, you know, in China, in the rural areas, the people are not very educated. You know, they're not uh, sophisticated. They haven't been uh, educated too much. Uh, and so, you know, the message of the cross like this, you know, they could readily accept perhaps. But in the big cities, you know, where you're dealing with students in the university, they are educated, they are sophisticated. You know, how are you going to present this to them? And I really couldn't give her a specific answer as to how, but I said, however you do it, you've got to bring them to the cross. The cross is central, whether it is um, to people unsophisticated, whether it's to people who are educated, whatever. Uh, adapt that to where they are and then bring them to the cross. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Let, let us go on. Um, I want to deal here with, was Luke a historian or a theologian? Now, those of you who are taking hermeneutics are going to notice we have some overlap here because you can't deal with acts in a Pentecostal school and not deal with this. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is, it is important. There has been a firestorm of controversy between evangelicals and Pentecostals over whether Luke was simply a historian or whether he was also a theologian. Did Luke write simply to give a history of Jesus and the early church, or did he write as a theologian to convey theology as well. This is crucial to the Pentecostal belief in the baptism in the Holy Spirit as an experience subsequent to salvation in which the Holy Spirit empowers a person for witness. There are two basic positions here on this. Uh, the, many evangelicals believe that Luke was primarily a historian who simply wrote facts with no theological intent. Pentecostals and a growing number of evangelicals believe that Luke, while writing accurate history, was a theologian in his own right, and that you can gain theology from his writings. Why is this important for Pentecostals? Because Paul did not address many matters that Luke did, such as baptism in the Holy Spirit, the initial, initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, whether or not it happens at salvation or is subsequent, and so forth. These are important matters. But if you cannot use Luke for learning the enduring truth about the nature of these things, you have a very limited basis for Pentecostal theology. Uh, two main proponents of the traditional evangelical uh, position is or are James D.G. Dunn and Max Turner. 
two representatives of the Pentecostal position are Roger Stronstad and Robert Menzies. Um, Gordon Fee is sort of an, an, an odd person here. He's a Pentecostal by experience, but he holds more to the evangelical way of handling the text. Um, so this is the issue. Can we get theology from Acts? Or can we only get history from Acts? The mention of the Holy Spirit, Spirit literally fills the book of Acts. It has variously been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit and the continuing of Jesus' ministry and his disciples. To cover all the teaching on the Holy Spirit in Acts would take a whole semester, uh, so we can't complete it. <coughs> Roger Stronstad um, outlines uh, the uh, thematic structure of Luke Acts. And uh, we're going to take a, a brief look at the teaching, but we, we just have to go really quickly. At the end of Luke 24, um, in verse 49, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then in Acts 1, 4 to 5, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then here is the fulfillment in Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here we have the promise of what is going to happen uh, in uh, the first part of chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Here's simply... I'm sorry, I have a question here. I'm sorry yes, to interrupt sir. you. Okay. Yeah, because... Uh, uh, it is an argument also for uh, Christians to uh, teaching regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whether uh, you receive salvation first and then you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit or uh, you can uh, uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time salvation. How is it goes, Dr. Like, uh, because... Uh, uh, some teach, uh, preachers or teachers are telling that uh, you cannot be baptized by the Holy Spirit if you are not saved. But uh, there are instances where I, like uh, for crusades, uh, I witness that even those who are coming at the altar receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, I see from their life that uh, there's a fruit on it. And uh, mm -hmm. I just don't know how to uh, explain uh, how the Holy Spirit transformed their lives. Maybe just like uh, Paul, that he encountered uh, Jesus at the same time. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so is the baptism of the Holy Spirit subsequent after salvation? Or does it happen at salvation. Um, yes. Okay, th there are basically three positions on that. The classical Pentecostal position is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second work of God in our lives that happens logically after salvation. So it is subsequent. We call that subsequence. Um, the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is witnessed by, or is evidenced by speaking in tongues. 
the, the, the charismatic position is uh, the same as the Pentecostal in that it is subsequent, but that it could be any of the gifts that is manifested rather than just tongues. So we have the classical Pentecostal, we have the charismatic, and then third, we have the new wave position. And that is that it's one experience that you receive the Holy Spirit in its fullness when you are saved. And then you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you after that. Um, so there is no subsequence there. And I think that that position is much like Gordon Fee's position. Um, speaking as a classical Pentecostal, I would say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is logically subsequent to salvation, but not necessarily chronologically subsequent to salvation. That is, a person may go to the altar, you know, he's a sinner, doesn't know God at all, but he responds to the altar call. He goes to the front of the church, he bows down, and he asks Jesus to be his Savior. And before long, he's speaking in tongues. It appears that it's all the same experience. Chronologically, it appears that way, but logically, we have salvation, and then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So even though chronologically it appears to be the same, logically they are separated. So we believe in subsequence, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to or after the experience of salvation. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. Uh, these are some of the places where uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Acts. And you can see there are many, many. Uh, we have Pentecost in chapter 2. And then we've uh, noted here by chapter 8, Samaria, chapter 9, Paul, chapter 10, Cornelius, and chapter 19, Ephesus. These are the five that are given in detail, and um, these are the five that are instrumental in the formation of a Pentecostal theology. Um, traditionally, the way that we have, have looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues comes from these five experiences that are related in Acts. In chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, they are, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they speak in other tongues as the Spirit uh, speaks through them, allows them to speak. In um, Samaria, Philip goes there, he preaches the gospel, the people receive the gospel, they experience uh, many great things from God, and uh, it has all the earmarks of, of them being saved. The apostles then come up, lay hands upon them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. It was manifested in some way, but we are not told how, because Elymas the sorcerer wanted to have the power that when he laid his hands on people, they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, there must have been some manifestation of that. Was it tongues? I would say probably so, but we're not told. In Acts 9, Paul uh, is converted and he receives the Holy Spirit. Did he speak in tongues when he received the Holy Spirit? Well, he didn't uh, receive uh, speaking in tongues at that time, but we know later on he did speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, 
in chapter 10, Cornelius. Cornelius sends for Peter, who comes to his home. Cornelius was a God-fearer, a person who was attracted to Judaism and worshiped God. And he, uh, Peter comes to his household, enters his house, which was forbidden to, for Jews to do, to enter the house of a Gentile. He entered his house, and there was a group of people there gathered to hear Peter. And as Peter speaks, the Holy Spirit comes on that crowd, and they speak in other tongues. And um, Peter says that we know that they received the Holy Spirit because they spoke in tongues as we did at the beginning. And then in Acts 19, there is a group of, of believers who have been baptized according to the baptism of John, not Christian baptism. So Paul baptizes them. They have not received the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. He lays his hands upon them. They are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they speak in tongues. So in three of these instances, it says that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. In two of them, tongues is implied. In Samaria, what happened there, we don't know for sure, but it's probably tongues. Paul it doesn't say spoken tongues at that time, but according to his own testimony, at a later time, he did speak in tongues. So it seems that in Acts, Luke is telling us that this is what is normative, at least normal, uh, to happen when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, we'll go back into that in just a minute. The church in the book of Acts, more than anything else, is a community of the Spirit. They are filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and led by the Spirit. Uh, here are principles from Roger Stronstadt about the Spirit in Acts. The gift of the Spirit is subsequent to salvation. The gift of the Spirit is always, always results in mission. The gift of the Spirit is always experiential. It is not just a change in your thinking or understanding. It is experienced. The gift of the Spirit is given for empowering and service. And the gift of the Spirit is available to all believers of all races, social settings, and times. Okay, um, it's time for a break. So let's take a 10-minute break, and we will come back in 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm.
All right. As we, as I said before, evangelicals tend to see Acts as uh, a historical book, not so much a theological book. Pentecostals believe that Luke was both a historian and a theologian. Uh, let me just say a word about our terminology. I've been using evangelical and contrasting that with Pentecostal. Actually, the difference, the two things should be non-Pentecostal evangelicals and Pentecostal evangelicals, because actually we're all evangelicals. Uh, we all are evangelical believers, but some of us are Pentecostal and believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. When Luke wrote Acts, he wrote to communicate theology as well as give history. So when he records an event, he does it to communicate more than just that it happened. His repeated historical emphases indicate his theological emphases. The way Pentecostals traditionally have articulated their theology of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as an experience subsequent to salvation and speaking in tongues as the initial physical evidence is to base it on historical precedence. Okay, this term historical precedence. That means we looked at what happened in the past and say, because Luke is telling us this is the way it happens, that he is giving us a theology, and he's telling us what is normative, what ought to happen as well. I, it's not that way for everything that happens, but when we understand that Luke's, Luke is emphasizing this, then we take it as his theological teaching. And uh, this is what I said before, so I'm not going to repeat it here, but these are the places in Acts where we see people filled with the Holy Spirit. According to evangelicals, historical precedence does not establish what is normative for the church today. Basically, the evangelical position starts with Paul's theology of the Holy Spirit and interprets Luke in terms of Paul. Stronstad and Bob Menzies say that we must not interpret Luke in terms of Paul. We must let Luke speak for himself. Luke's theology of the Spirit, they say, while it is not contradictory to Paul's, is distinct. For Luke, the role of the Spirit is not conversion initiation, it is empowering for service. So, evangelicals reject the Pentecostal position to a large extent because it is based on historical precedence saying just because it happened doesn't mean it's supposed to happen. <clears throat> um, Bob Menzies says that Luke's theology of the Spirit is more primitive than that of Paul. Paul's theology of the Spirit is more developed than that of Luke. Paul teaches that the Holy Spirit is involved in what we call conversion initiation. The Holy Spirit is active in a person's being converted, being saved, okay? But for Luke, Luke sees the role of the Spirit as that of empowerment for service. So when we read Acts, we see that the giving of the Spirit is not to be connected with salvation, but is to be connected with empowering. Have you followed me there? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So for Luke, the giving of the Spirit is not connected with becoming a Christian. It's connected with empowerment in the Christian life. So Menzi says that Paul was the first to attribute conversion initiation to the Holy Spirit 
and that Luke does not reflect that theology. Luke, ne Luke never attributes soteriological functions to the Spirit, and Luke describes the gift of the Spirit exclusively in charismatic terms as the, the source of power for effective witness. And then Minzi says, here then is a strong argument for a doctrine of subsequence, that is, spirit baptism in the Pentecostal or Lucan sense, is logically distinct from conversion. This logical distinction reflects Luke's distinctive theology of the spirit. Note that this argument is not based on biblical analogy or historical precedent. Okay, so this is another argument for the fact that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience that is logically subsequent to conversion. All right. Do you have questions, comments here? All right. Then let us uh, go ahead and go on to Paul. Doctor, one last question, sorry, for, uh, uh, for the Book of Acts regarding the empowerment. Uh, in connection to the Old Testament, uh, they, I think uh, empowerment means it is the external, if I'm not mistaken, the external anointing uh, of God's people, like uh, what uh, uh, happened to Moses, to Gideon, and to Saul. Uh, did you and say the, external anointing? Yes, doctor. This anointing of oil. Okay. Uh, so, uh, because some of churches practice up to this time uh, this way of uh, anointing their leaders, and uh, can we conclude that this is al already obsolete as a uh, and all the way of practice in the Old Testament, Doctor. I don't think that there's anything theologically um, wrong with anointing, um, but I, it's not commanded anywhere. In fact, I don't know that there is any guidelines along those lines. How is a person, uh, I'm getting noise. Um, does somebody have their, their mic on or off on? Uh, we really don't have guidelines on how we install a person into church leadership. Is that, is that what you're asking, Romer? Okay. Uh, and I don't know, you could, you could go back to Old Testament precedents if you want. I don't think we have any evidence as to how that was done in the early church. Uh, we, we are told that Paul appointed elders in the church, but we're not told what kind of a ceremony uh, they went through. Now, when we look at the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul refers to an experience that Timothy had which seems like an ordination ceremony in which the elders laid their hands upon him and uh, he was perhaps empowered, given a gift at that time. Uh, so you can, you can look that up in, uh, I believe it is, well, I think both first and second Timothy. Uh, there's this reference to what seems like an ordination service. But other than that, we are not told what specifically was said or done uh, for those who were being initiated into places of leadership in the church. Okay? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's go on to Paul. Uh, we have a lot of PowerPoints here, and uh, some of that I'm going to uh, skip over for now. But um, let us go ahead and 
Look at Paul. Paul's influence. Uh, the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian thinker and theologian other than Jesus Christ himself. The impact that the Apostle Paul had upon the church is incalculable. When we consider Romans, just that one book, we can see how that book changed the course of Western culture. That book that was written by Paul. And then you add all of his other writings, and it is, uh, it is amazing. My life was transformed in a college course, my first semester at our Assemblies of God College in uh, California, in which I took a course from Dr. Gordon Fee called Pauline Epistles B, the Prison and Pastoral Epistles of Paul. And in that course, my life was transformed. When I really came to understand the teaching about, about grace, I discovered grace in that class and it changed my life. It was like seeing in color for the first time. And uh, it's not only me, it is millions of people who can give the same kind of testimony about Paul's influence. What about Paul and Jesus? Paul built on, but did not repeat the ministry of Jesus. Paul not only is an important person in the Christian church, he's also controversial. Some see him as the greatest Christian teacher that ever lived. Other people see him as starting a different religion from that of Jesus. After all, when you read the Gospels and then you read Paul, you get a different feel. Uh, it's just, it's like they're in two different worlds almost. And of course, there are differences. Jesus had an itinerant ministry preaching in a largely rural farming uh, area. <coughs> Uh, the people that he ministered to were not, for the most part, highly sophisticated urban people. When we get to Paul, he takes the gospel about Jesus to the urban centers of the Roman Empire, and there is uh, simply a different, uh, a different feel. But can we find a common root to the beliefs of Jesus and Paul? Was Paul applying and expanding what Jesus believed and taught, or was he simply going his own way? And this has been a matter of discussion for a long time. How do Paul and Jesus relate? You know, Paul doesn't quote Jesus a lot. And uh, Bultmann says that... Um, the only thing that's important for Paul is the fact that Jesus lived on earth and that for Paul, he doesn't really care what Jesus taught, uh, anything like that, just that Jesus lived and was crucified. And the last sentence there, beyond that, Jesus' manner of life, his ministry, his personality, his character play no role at all. Neither does Jesus' message. That's what Bultmann says about what Paul uh, thinks of Jesus. <coughs> in 1997, uh, a writer by the name of A.N. Wilson wrote a book entitled Paul, the Mind of the Apostle, in which he said that Paul, not Jesus, was the founder of Christianity. And he is just one of several people who have said that in recent years. Uh, however, since that time, Wilson has become a believer. He's become a Christian, and uh, I'm sure that his, his uh, feelings on that have changed. Paul saw himself as a proclaimer of Jesus Christ to the, to, uh, the Gentiles. He proclaimed the Jewish God as revealed in Jesus to the Gentile world. Now, you would not expect 
Paul simply to redo everything that Jesus had done. Paul was a Jew. He never abandoned the teachings of the Old Testament. He was a faithful Jew until the day he died. But he saw that Jesus was the Messiah that the Old Testament had looked forward to. He was what uh, today uh, Messianic congregations called a completed Jew. Paul greatly respected the law of Moses and saw it as the word of God. His religious concepts are all derived from the Old Testament and from the teachings of Jesus. And of course, there were implications of Jesus coming that affected how Paul looked at contemporary Judaism. If Jesus was God's perfect sacrifice, then that has implications for the sacrifices in the temple. I want to give you a quote from N.T. Wright. He says, it should be clear that if Paul had simply trotted out parrot fashion every line of Jesus' teaching, if he had repeated the parables, if he had tried to do again what Jesus did in announcing and inaugurating the kingdom, he would not have been endorsing Jesus as an appropriate and loyal follower should. He would have been denying him. Someone who copies exactly what a would-be Messiah does is himself trying to be a Messiah, which means denying the earlier claim. When we see the entire sequence within the context of Jewish eschatology, we are forced to realize that for Paul to be a loyal servant of Jesus Christ, as he describes himself, could never mean that Paul would repeat Jesus' unique one-off announcement of the kingdom to his fellow Jews. What we are looking for is not a parallelism between two abstract messages. It is the appropriate continuity between two people living and conscious of living at different points in the eschatological timetable. One thing that, uh, that Paul realized I'll bring up this word, Heil's Geschichte here, holy history. Jesus and Paul were at different points in God's eschatological timetable. Jesus came, he ministered before the cross, before the resurrection, before the giving of the Spirit at Pentecost. Paul came afterwards. And for Paul to pretend that the crucifixion, resurrection, the giving of the Spirit had not happened uh, would, would be ridiculous. Those things happened, and that changed everything. So there is a difference in the point of where Jesus was in God's timetable and where Paul was. And so that determines the characteristic of their ministry. Two examples here. Uh, is the, uh, the resurrection and the giving of the Spirit. Both of these are eschatological events. The Jews were looking forward to the day of the Lord when uh, the Holy Spirit would be given and the resurrection would take place. Paul came to understand that in the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection, which was thought to be at the end, had already begun in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, he wrote, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be alive, be made alive but each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then he, when he comes, those who belong to him. The resurrection that was seen to happen at the end of time has now moved into the middle of history. That happened in Christ. We are now living between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. And um, 
that is is one way that um, the uh, the the uh, coming of or the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the coming of the Spirit has affected Paul's uh, outlook. And the same thing with the giving of the Spirit. The Jews believed that the giving of the Spirit was going to come at the end, but we see that it came in the middle of history again. And now we are experiencing the powers of the age to come, the giving of the Spirit, the reception of eternal life. And um, so Paul and Jesus are at two different places on the eschatological timetable. Do you have questions or comments about that? All right. I have a section here on the new perspective on Paul. Um, what I have done here is basically put my notes onto Moodle. So if you go onto Moodle, uh, where we're talking about Paul, you will find a little document there, not too little, I think it's probably 17 pages or so, uh, called The New Perspective on Paul, or Notes on the New Perspective on Paul. It's not an academic paper, um, but it's just uh, some notes that I have made about the new perspective. And you will get everything that you need to know for this class there. Um, we, uh, this, is, this is important to know. And uh, I can guarantee you that on the final exam, there's going to be something on the new perspective on Paul. It may be a, a single true-false question, or it may be a major essay question. But, uh, but, excuse me, just be prepared. The new perspective on Paul is basically a new perspective on first century Judaism. Traditionally, the Protestant church has looked at first century Judaism as being a legalistic works righteousness religion. And um, the new perspective says that rather than being legalistic, it was a religion of grace, forgiveness, and it has a means of atonement. And so it gives a different view of, first of all, first, uh, first century Judaism, and then how Paul is interpreted in light of that new perspective. And um, I'm not going to go into detail uh, here in class, but um, we will just briefly uh, go through the PowerPoint here. In fact, most of the PowerPoint we won't go through. Clyde Montefior, George Foot Moore, W.D. Davies, Christopher Stendhal, all of these were saying basically that Judaism is a, a religion of grace, and um, the idea that it is legalistic comes from not from the New Testament, but from Martin Luther. It was, it was E.P. Sanders who really started what we call the New Perspective on Paul. These other people uh, gave their perspectives earlier, uh, Montefior and Moore, but nobody paid attention to them. But when Sanders came along in 1977 with his book entitled Paul and Palestinian Judaism, many people got on his bandwagon. Many joined him. In fact, probably a majority of New Testament scholars agreed with Sanders. Uh, two of those were, let me just go down here, James D.G. Dunn, uh, an evangelical. These are two evangelical scholars, Dunn and N.T. Wright. Dunn and Wright have, to a certain extent, agreed with Sanders they agreed with him to a great extent on his evaluation of first century Judaism. 
uh, they disagree with him on what Sanders says about Paul, but they agree to a great extent on his evaluation of first century Judaism, that it was a religion of grace, a religion of forgiveness, and uh, that it had a means of atonement. Um, I will just tell you that I am very hesitant to accept the new perspective on Paul. Um, the view of Judaism that is given in the New Testament is that it is a quite legalistic religion. Think of what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Uh, you know, they're keeping all these laws, all these rules, and yet they have uh, abandoned the most important things, you know, like, like mercy. <coughs> um, Paul's view of the Jews also was that it was quite legalistic. And um, I think that their stand, Wright and Dunn's stand, has been quite well answered by others in the uh, evangelical uh, academy. Okay, I'm not going to go into any more detail here, but I'm going to allow you to read that document. And then if you have any questions, you can ask it and we will uh, try to answer it in class. Okay, does that sound fair enough? The reason is we have a lot of territory to cover. And so I want to go ahead and, uh, and get as far as we can. And by doing this, we can get through Paul a lot quicker. Uh, under the center of uh, Pauline theology, what is it that is the center, most important thing that everything else in Paul's theology revolves around? And we just give some different options here from different scholars. For Martin Luther, it was justification by faith. For Albert Schweitzer, mystical union with Christ. Rudolf Bultmann, the decision of faith. George Eldon Ladd, the redemptive work of Christ as a center of redemptive history. Ralph Martin, this reconciliation. N.T. Wright, the death and resurrection of Christ and his exaltation as Lord. Uh, Herman Ritterboss, salvation history. Uh, J. Christian Baker, the triumph of God. Frank Thielman, God's graciousness toward the weak and sinful creatures. Douglas Moo, God's act in Christ, getting pretty general. Thomas Schreiner, God himself. And that is, uh, that's pretty general. I think that um, a better way to go is to go with Gordon Fee. And he sees four elements in Paul's theology that are key here. The foundation is a gracious and merciful God who is full of love toward all. Okay, the foundation then is God himself. The framework, the fulfillment of God's promises has already begun, but not yet completed. So this is the already not yet, the eschatological framework. In Christ, the promises have begun to be fulfilled, but they are not yet completely fulfilled. Number three, the focus. Jesus, the Son of God, who is God's suffering servant Messiah, accomplished eschatological salvation for humanity through his death and resurrection, and who is now the exalted Lord and coming King. So the focus is on Jesus. He is the Messiah. And then the fruit, the church as an eschatological community who formed as a people by Christ's death and the gift of the spirit and thus restored into God's likeness becomes God's new covenant people. So rather than look for the one thing that is the center, I think that, uh, that Fee's idea here is, is, is better. 
four pillars upon which Paul's theology stands. The foundation of God, the framework of the uh, eschatological fulfillment, partial fulfillment, the already not yet, the focus of Jesus, and the fruit of the church. Okay, Paul and Revelation. Uh, again, I am going to skip this. So uh, do not worry about this section. Uh, basically here under Paul and eschatology, uh, we have here the, uh, the outlook of Scripture. And that is, uh, here we have the way the Jews looked at uh, the ages, that we are living in this age, in an age of sin, an age of pain, of death, of war. But we are looking forward to the age to come, when God, on the day of the Lord, intervenes in human history, sets the Messiah on the throne, and the age to come is characterized by joy and peace and the forgiveness of sins and the giving of the Spirit and all the benefits that we as Christians know. So this was the Jewish look. We are living in this age, but we are looking forward to the age to come, started by the day of the Lord, in which God will set up his visible kingdom on earth. With the coming of Christ, this was modified. We are now between the cross and resurrection and the second coming. We're between the first coming and the second coming. Jesus brought about the coming of the kingdom of God but it is not here in its fullness. So we have experienced, as the book of Hebrews says, the powers of the age to come, and yet we are still living in this age. So um, we experience eternal life, and yet we die. We experience the forgiveness of sins, and yet we sin. We experience the peace of God, and yet there are wars. And all of those promises that are being fulfilled are not yet fulfilled in their fullness. So we also are looking forward to the day of the Lord, which is the day of the Lord Jesus, Jesus' second coming, in which the age to come will be here in its fullness. Okay, do you have questions or comments about this? Questions or comments? All right. Then let us go on to the life of Paul. I just got a note here that I'm not plugged in. So hold on just a second. Okay, let us look at the life of the Apostle Paul. First of all, his birth and childhood. You know, as we study the life of Paul, there is general agreement among scholars about uh, when Paul was born, when he died. Uh, most scholars are pretty much in agreement on the uh, uh, chronology of his life. Uh, there are some who disagree and have different, different viewpoints, but uh, basically Paul was born shortly after Christ, was converted in the 19, or 19, in the 30s, and uh, died in the 60s. That would be a basic chronology of his life. He was born a Roman citizen in Tarsus, a great seaport in Cilicia. 
Uh, Tarsus was a, uh, a large city. It was an important city. It was steeped in Greek culture. We don't know, however, how long Paul was there. We don't know when he moved to Jerusalem. His parents were Roman citizens, so he inherited his Roman citizenship from his parents. Now, up in the top here, we have Tarsus. It's in the province of Cilicia, and uh, you can see that in relation to Jerusalem down below. Paul was reared in Jerusalem. In Acts 22.3, Paul says that he was born in Tarsus and brought up or reared in Jerusalem. The word brought up or reared refers to home training. Then he says that he was educated or taught according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. He was taught by the famous rabbi Gamaliel. And uh, he says that he uh, was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, but exactly when this happens, we're not told. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. Now, uh, I was brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel, but he doesn't tell us when. And so there's controversy about how old Paul was when he went to Jerusalem. Paul's parents were Aramaic-speaking Jews, as was Paul, as we learn from Philippians 3.5. He says, uh, he was a Hebrew born of Hebrews. So he was a, a Aramaic speaker born of those who spoke Aramaic. We know that Paul also spoke Greek, uh, as we see from his letters. So this is basically all that we know about Paul's early life. Any questions or comments here? All right, Paul the man. We see that Paul was a man of three worlds. The first world was that of Judaism. This is where Paul had his religious roots. To his dying day, Paul was a Jew, even if his fellow Jews would have called him a heretic. His Bible was our Old Testament. The difference between him and his contemporary Jews was that Paul saw that Jesus was the Messiah. It was not simply though a um, intellectual experience. Paul was born again. Paul had received the Holy Spirit into his life. And so he was um, a, um, a completed Jew there having um, seeing that Jesus was the Messiah. All right, um, our time is up. We will have to stop here. We'll take up here next time. God bless you. We'll see you then. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.